Hey everybody, I'm Forbes Riley, and I'm here with two very special guests. We're talking about something that's very close to my heart, very dear to theirs, and if it's not close to yours, perhaps you don't even know it just yet. It's all about addiction. It's an epidemic in this country and around the world. And now it's worse than ever, probably because of COVID. But I'll tell you what, I just recently lost a dear friend of mine. My producer lost his son. I'm hearing this more and more. You don't want to get it so close to your home that you end up at a funeral home. Promise me. My, uh, we're going to a funeral next week for a 24-year-old who really didn't know what he was doing to himself because, hey, what's a little recreational drug use? Have a drink here and there, smoke a little pot, right? Seemed fine when we were growing up. Not in today's age. My guest, uh, Dan Manson, has written an amazing book that we're gonna talk about. He's here with Angie Manson. They co-own Elevate, an amazing recovery facility, and I wanna talk about how today's conversation is closer to home than you realize. Angie? Wow. And how much I adore you, and Dan, you. so nice to have you, you both too. here. Uh, pretty fascinating book here. It's called Redefining Addiction, Reinventing Recovery. And I noticed that your dedication, this is what really touched me, is to all the families who are losing a loved one to addiction and struggling to find the answers they need to make it through the crisis. Why did you write this? I wrote it because I have been doing this for 26 years and I can only help the people that are in front of me in, the, in my facilities up to this point. And I decided that I wanted to get the message out to more people who would never set foot in any of my facilities. And I thought that I could take my experience and actually tell people just very directly that here's what's going on out there. Here's how the treatment industry works. Here's how uh, drug addiction is treated in other facilities. Here's how you know we treat people and what works at Elevate. And I just wanted to just share it with the world. And I, I thought that if I could do that, I would be uh, touching more people that way. Well, and you are. And Angie, you come to this whole world of addiction and recovery firsthand, girl, right? Yep. <laughs> at 11 right. years old, this is a story you're not gonna wanna miss. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. How does it, how did you, but cause you, I look at you, you look amazing. I know you're successful, you own a company, you're doing all of these things, but it didn't start out that way for you, did it? Right, no, I started at a really young age. My mom was working very hard to support the two of us and I headed down a path at a very young age. I started at 11 and because of starting so young, I had an addiction very young. By the time I was 16, I was in my first rehab. By the time I was 18, I'd been arrested seven times. So my path was very difficult to navigate because my brain was not in the right place. What is your mom thinking yeah. this whole time? She's thinking she's doing everything she can to support us. And I kept my grades up, I kept the facade up, so I don't think she realized how bad it was. She was also very tough love. So, you know, if she were to take things from me, if she were to ground me, if she were to do these things, it really? was going to handle it. Did you guys all hear, I'm sorry, how good were you in school? I was at, early on, getting yeah. A's. I was very smart, it was very easy for me. So drugs don't happen to bad, stupid people, do they? No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's a stereotype, isn't it's it? It's a perception. Oh yeah, you know, you're a bad person, that's what you're doing. You look like an adorable, amazing person, and you had good grades, and your mom didn't know for a while, did she? Absolutely not. Do you think you're a parent who might not know what's going on in your house? I have two, I have two teenagers, actually, they just turned 20. We had a little conversation recently. Mm. I work very hard, too. They let me know what the kids in their world were doing, and the things that, I, I, they shocked me. I had no idea that as young as middle school, they were exposed to things. And what they shared with me was fascinating and very helpful is that mom, we did experiment a little bit. Do you expect that of us? We don't do any of it now. You gave us a great home and a great foundation and we don't want to. Because can you tell people what to do or do they have to find it themselves? Well, you know, the teenage years are, is often about self-discovery and rebellion. And right. so they want to figure it out on their own. They can be told something, but you know, it depends on the message and the messenger. So if it's a loving person that they trust, like their mother or something like that, and you're getting real with them, like, hey, honey, you may be exposed to drugs. Instead of saying, you better not do drugs, you could say something like, you may be exposed to it, and here's how I'd like you to handle it, and you can always talk to me about it. That goes so much further than uh, the other way of trying to enforce someone. Does your mom feel guilty at all? I mean, here, I, my image of what you've painted is she's out there working really hard. You're a great daughter, you have a sister or a brother? Only child. Only child, it was the two of you, it's just the two of you. Yes. Wow. Yes, so that oh. was an interesting dynamic, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you let her down at all? I I think so. I think I did. You did. know, because she was already doing so much at such a young age to support the two of us, and right. I had absolutely no appreciation of what she was going through. Instead, I was blaming her for all the things I didn't have. 
Oh, which I'm made sure. it very easy for me to go down the, you know, I this look at the stuff that's happening to me. This is why I'm this way. And so I definitely took it out on her. Your clarity moment. Do you remember what that was when you were finally like, I don't need to ever go back to that life? Yeah. What was that? That was when I realized I'd strung together enough time without the need of it. And I felt good about that. It wasn't like, oh, I'm sorry. I feel so good. It was like, wait a minute. I haven't used it in a while. And I actually feel really good. It was when I realized that I had gotten to the other side of it without the need of something. What is on the other side of addiction? It can be a wonderful, productive, fun, healthy, happy life. Oh, but wait, wait. I read in here that <laughs> institutions are saying that you're forever an addict. You have a disease. It's incurable. Right. Be miserable. Right. Yeah. Is that true? Label. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Life is what you make it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's from a woman who's been in jail how many times? Uh, well, as a juvenile, seven. Yeah. But As an adult, a couple. And I don't mean it because I think we have judgment about this. Right. I don't hear conversations of people on the other side going, look, there's ways to make a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. And what you did in this book was to identify that the system doesn't support a healthy recovery, does it? Right. Yeah, exactly. You're told you're an addict, you're an addict for life, and they're going to need to manage this, all your cravings forever with medications or whatever. You know, you're in this sort of this medical model. And, you know, I don't, I don't buy that. I think people can, should be empowered to overcome whatever they have to overcome. Maybe they need to lose 100 pounds. Maybe they need to overcome some other trauma issues as a child or something. Maybe they need to overcome addiction. These are things that people can overcome if they work hard enough. I, I just hate the labels that, you know, you tell someone, once an addict, always an addict. Well, boy, that's pretty depressing, isn't it? Right. You tell you, you told that when you're 18 years old, well, get, you know, the rest of your life is going to be miserable, kid. Well, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to hate it. I bet you guys have seen some amazing stories. Oh. oh, every day. So many. Yeah. Lives back from every denomination, like you talked about, every social social demographic, like we see it every single day. People older in their life, they finally get to enjoy their grandkids. People younger in their life, they get to have grandkids someday. We get to see it from every angle and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. How do you know if you're an addict? Well, if your life is going in a direction that is not productive, if the thing that you're taking is not serving you, it's one thing if you have, let's say a glass of wine. Okay, and, and you have a glass of wine and you're going about the rest of your, your day and your life and your work and it's not really affecting anything. Okay, well then maybe you're not, right? So, uh, but if you drink bottles of wine a night and you do that consistently and you're starting to have health issues and you're starting to forget important appointments or you're starting to not feel like you want to get up and go to your kid's soccer game, which is what a parent should want to do, right? right? Because you're just, you know, you'd rather you're hung over or whatever. So how is your quality of life? Is the substance serving you or not? I think that's, and, and sometimes people are obviously in denial about that. So you can also talk to loved ones and close friends about it. Like, hey, be real with me, right? Do you think I do you think I have a problem? And if they're really a good friend, they'll tell you the truth. And sometimes it's good to get that honest feedback from people who would tell you the truth because they care about you. But not always the case. If they feel like they're not doing well either, they may not want to expose it because oh, then especially they don't they're want one of your using exposed. buddies. No, we're oh, all yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. so true. that can't always be a barometer. But I also would say, if if you are no longer in control of it, it's controlling you. Like I can't get through the day without thinking, oh my god, I can't wait to dinner time to get that glass of wine, or I cannot wait for Friday night because that's when we get to like really, you know, enjoy the weekend and relax. When you start not being in control of it and it's controlling you, that's a problem. Or obsessing about it. Who is this right for? So I wrote that for uh, everyday people, mostly parents, um, but people who just, you know, they, they've heard one message. They've heard the sort of the just say no or something like that. And they, or they've heard once an addict, always an addict. And I think that there's a lot more to say about that. And I just, I wanted to have every everyday people learn about addiction and treatment. Well, it's very well written, very well laid out. And I do think it's for everybody, certainly if you've got kids right now, yes. because you do not know. They used to say, whether you, I was sending the kids to a public school or a private school, they simply said the private school, it's got better drugs. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a second, I'm sorry. what? That's not a joke, is it? That's like kind of real. Sure. And uh, the problem now is, and you said on the back of your book that there was a war on drugs. We've been talking about that phrase for decades, a war right. on drugs. The war now is you can die. Right. And not from long-term being strung out, but one time. Right. What's going on with this word fentanyl? What is it? So fentanyl is a substance that is 50 times more potent and powerful than heroin. 
right? Which we were, we were growing up, heroin was like, that was the, the granddaddy drug where people actually died from it. <clears throat> now this is 50 times more powerful. And you know, you can overdose on something that could fit on the, on the tip of your, of your pinky. Is it a drug that people want to do? Sometimes. What was the point of fentanyl in the beginning? So fentanyl is an opiate. Right? It's just a very, very strong opiate. So okay. if people are, are on using heroin and they want something stronger or, you know, or they have access to it, they can get it. It was, it was created for end of life and like just some of the worst pain. You, you were in a car accident and, you're, and you had 50 shattered bones in your body. You're given, given fentanyl, right? Oh. In okay. a hospital. That, okay. that was what its original purpose was. And then now it's gotten out. Right. So it's mass produced. It's cheap. It's easy. Comes in pills. They're lacing it in everything. So, yes, yeah, sometimes people absolutely know they're taking it. But a lot of times, especially Who's these days, it they don't. What, what's, what is going on here? Who's putting it in things? You know, Dealers? Yeah. Why, why would someone put fentanyl in pot and then sell the pot? Uh, you know, th these are nefarious people who have evil intentions. Well, because I would think as, a, as an e-commerce, as a in person of business, I don't want to kill my user. I want to kill my customer. Right. So something else is going on. Yes. And do we need to be aware of that as parents? Absolutely. And it and you need to be you need to know your kids need to know about it a lot younger than you think. They're getting exposed to this stuff at very young ages. So I think one of the points of this show today for all of you listening is yes, if your child is an addict, if their the behavior is absolutely shifted and you know they need help, that's where you go you talk about elevate and you say, Hey, I got a place for you to go. But there's an awareness that we want to raise with everyone because a little pot that seems to be legal in many places. Mm -hmm. You can get it. Sure. My neighbor across the street, 24 years old, today he is no longer. And I can't express to you how that is shattering to everyone. Um, my producer lost his son. Suddenly. It's, it's not like, it's like what, what just happened. And you keep hearing this word fentanyl and fentanyl. Then you hear about little kids who find it, I guess it's described, it's disguised as Skittles or candy. Yeah. So there is a war, not on drugs, but a war on us. Yeah. The war on the innocent, the naive, right. the, the weekend partier. Right. It feels like, it, yeah, if you were to go, you know, destroy a country, what would you do? You'd flood it with drugs and kill as many people as you could. Or get them all addicted. Either kill them or get them addicted so that they're not operating the way they should. Yeah. And the people that are doing this are not well, right? They're, ev they're evil or they're, or they're motivated by money or something like that. They don't right. care about human life. So it's hard to think, well, why would they do this? We, we don't know why, but we know it's happening. And that's why we w want to talk to people. Like you think your kid's smoking weed. Okay, I get it. He's probably not going to die if he's smoking weed. But right. he better know where he's getting it from because if he gets it in his place with fentanyl, your kid's going to die. Okay, it's all, it's just like, it's beyond frightening at the moment. And that's, and I'm, I hope that you're a little frightened. I hope that you're like, wait, what did they just say? My kids could die from smoking weed? Hello, that really is one of the crazy things. I right. mean, can you yeah. imagine? No. Does it make any sense? No. Yeah. Back in, the, back in our day, that was not the yeah, case. Yeah, I spoke plenty of weed, you know? It, it, <laughs> it's how it worked. It, you, you, no, no one ever thought you were going to dry. You thought you'd eat too much, you know? Yeah, the worst thing that's happened, yeah, you have too much munchies. Right, right. you fall asleep, right. So that is definitely an issue, but it's also on the other side of this. I don't want to leave out alcohol because alcohol is a very, very deadly drug. You know where it's deadly? When the alcoholic or the person who had a drink or two gets behind the wheel and thinks it's okay to drive a car. Right. And so raising awareness for me is on all levels. Yeah. You know, when Mothers Against Drunk Driving happen, it's, it's not an isolated incident. It happens every day, all day. You see people driving the wrong way down a freeway, you know, killing kids and families and innocents, and that's not acceptable. And so you talk about a unique way to overcome addictions and what's one insight you could give to the audience right now? This is if you've got any kind of problem, if you decide that something's controlling you, yeah. what's the first thing you should do, Dan? I think you should acknowledge that you're not a victim. You have to be responsible for your actions. Now, you could have been victimized by some things in your life like we all have. You could have had traumas or, or different things that have happened that cause you to want to turn to that alcohol. Well, you know, my dad hit me, so I, I drank. Okay, that's a terrible thing that happened. But ultimately, if you choose to remain the victim and, and turn to those substances and say, it's not my fault, I got hit or something like that, well, you're not going to get any better. And that's kind of the raw, real truth that people need to hear. You may have been victimized by life, but if you play the victim, you're not going to get out of it. How do you feel about that? I 100% agree. And that's what kept me in my addiction as long as I did, because I had so many people agree that, yes, you had this bad stuff. No wonder you're this way. And it just, it gave me the permission to continue on that path. And it wasn't until I came into the program where I was put on the spot that said, 
yes, but what did you do? And 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 now let's fix that. You know, one of the things that I do in, in, in my world is I teach breakthrough training, a little traumatic healing, and I love that. And I have this thought that memories aren't real. Yeah. Is that they're, you can remember them, you can think about them, or you can not think about them. And if you and I all saw the same thing and we remembered it years from now, we'd all see something different, so which one of us had it real? But it's de the decision that you made about it. And can you unmake those decisions? Right. Just because you're walking across the floor when you're five years old, you tripped, everyone laughed at you. Now you're 15, like, oh, I'm a klutz. No, you had a goofy incident back then. Let's heal that. So part of what we're doing is how to heal ourselves yeah. to stay drug-free. Uh, you know, you can't tell people what not to do, but you could say it's a little bit like Russian roulette. Take a gun, put one bullet in it, you click it six times, you're dead. One time, maybe not. Two times, maybe not. Three times, oops. So you don't know. So for you, if you're a weekend user of any kind, if your kids are partying, have this conversation. Yeah. Show them statistics. Take them to the morgue. Do what they did with us. Scared straight. Mm -hmm. Go, I'm not doing that because that's what you want. And then decide that, that the alcohol and the drugs to suppress your feelings. Sometimes is it okay just to be sad? Absolutely. That's the biggest thing we teach. Because again, with other programs, they're like, oh, you're, you're sad, you have anxiety, you're depression, let's medicate that. We're saying, no, feel, it's okay. Someone died, you can be sad. That person cut you off, you can be mad. It's okay, experience emotion, don't bottle it up, now let's move on. Right. And I've, in a society where we're telling everybody, if you don't like the way you feel, take something, take something, take something, take something. It's really important that we start saying, you don't need to take something. Just experience it and then get to the other side of it. Wow. Does that resonate with you? Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing how medicated people are these days. Even young people, people in their 20s who are on five, six, seven prescriptions because they have anxiety and they're depressed and they're this and they're that. Or even as teenagers. Well, who, who didn't have awkwardness as a teenager? Who didn't, That is you know, the definition of being a teenager. Right. Anxiety, anger, yes. depression, confusion. Right. So right. if you, if you oh, medicate yeah. your way through that and you're told that, oh, you shouldn't be having those feelings, let's give you some pills so you feel a little bit better, what kind of lesson is that teaching them about how to get through life? You know, one of my favorite lessons about being uncomfortable, I think that's, we don't like being uncomfortable. Yeah. I grew up in Long Island near a lobster farm and lobsters have their shells, their, their skeleton on the outside, right? And it, a little lobster to grow to a big lobster has to back out of a shell that it's very uncomfortable in. Now it's exposed, anybody can eat it, grow under, see I hang on a rock going, grow shell, grow, and it does grow. Well, one day for Mother's Day, uh, my family got a 100 pound, a 20 pound lobster. It mm -hmm. was about 100 years old. Wow. Uh, it was, it represented, we didn't have a whole lot of money and they, they we, we, my parents went through some things and they guys, you know what, we're gonna give this to you for Mother's Day. And it was amazing uh, until I realized that Oh my God, he was like a hundred years old. And it meant so much to us that we, glued, my dad glued the claws together and kept them under a little fish tank that we had his whole life. When he died, I buried him with one of the claws. Oh. Because the message to me ultimately was that it's okay to be uncomfortable. Hmm. If humans were lobsters, we'd never get to be that big. We'd be little one pounds running around because we're all medicated going, no, I'm fine, I'm not uncomfortable. Right. And when I look at people like that, I'm like, struggle. Get a little bit, a little grit under you. It's not always going to be wonderful. Surround yourself with people you can talk to. And if all else fails, know that all you have to is pick up a phone. And there's a place called Elevate yeah. that is designed to get you through this time in your life. And that there's an end. My understanding is that you want to graduate people and kick them out the door. Yeah. You can love on them on the other end, but yeah. go, little birdies, go fly, yes? Absolutely. So to that, you are going to do something crazy. You're going to give this book away? Yeah. Uh, it's not free to print, you know. It says it right I know, <laughs> I know, I know. Usually, authors want to make money when they sell, write a book. I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to give away money, but Why you that's okay. That? I just want the message out. You know, after a while, I, I just decided that I want to try to reach more people. People resonate a lot with Elevate's methods, and I can only get so many people into the program. So if I could write a book and they could understand a little bit more, uh, you know, that's just that would mean a lot for me. I love that. And is there anything you want to look at the camera and say to an addict, a mom, a dad, a loved one, a friend about what they could do to help somebody or help themselves? Uh, I would say reach out for help, even if it's not us or help, let us help you find the right help. It's life or death. This isn't like a game. There are no take backs. And I, I would much rather somebody opt for being uncomfortable to handle something with somebody that might make them feel uncomfortable. And maybe they're angry at you, but maybe you're saving a life. You, sometimes we've got to be willing to be the bad guy in order to save a life and be the good guy. So, uh, and maybe that conversation isn't the be all end all, but maybe they come back in a week and two weeks when they get a DUI and they're like, you know what, now I'm ready. 
And yeah. thoughts from you, Mr. Dan? Right there. Yeah, I would just say, as a parent myself, uh, I know how difficult it is, and it's okay to ask for help. And it's okay to call and just say, hey, I don't know if my kid is struggling or not. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I don't know if they're going to hate me. But uh, you tell me what I, what I should do. And we're willing to have that conversation, whether you come into our program or not. We just want to talk to you. And to that end, that's a very interesting. When you do call the number to elevate, yeah. you don't get an operator in another country who is just paid to answer the phone. Yeah. You get who? At any time you call 24-7, 365, you're going to talk to a human being. So we have a bunch of addiction counselors. If they're all busy, then you may talk to somebody who has to set an appointment or take a message. But we are going to call you back and you're going to speak to somebody who's been there, who's been through addiction, who's been in recovery, and they understand everything about it. All right. I want you to look in that camera. I want you to pitch your book. Somebody out there needs to read this. So I wrote this book because I want to help you guys. I want to help pe everyday people who don't know anything about addiction, or maybe they do know something about addiction, and they want to know why their kid has gone to rehab five times and is still struggling. So I tell you everything that I've learned over my 26 years about how to treat people and also how the addiction treatment industry works, how the government works, the pharmaceutical companies, the insurance uh, companies, all those things that I wish you know, I would have known. I know a lot of parents wish they would have known. And so I'm trying to just get the message out and uh, provide you guys with some value. I personally think this is amazing. Um, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your dedication. Um, you've been a friend for a while, and I, I don't think I realized until we sat down and really delved into this about how important Elevate is, and I really do think that is. And hearing you and watching you get very emotional is, is very motivating. Uh, what's one thing you want a listener to take away from this show? There is hope. There is help. There is education. There is stuff out there. You just got to be willing to take that step. Mm. And not every program is the same. If you think you've tried rehab and you failed, Elevate is a completely different experience. You know, we empower you, you're not powerless. We help you, uh, you discover for yourself what's been going on. We don't tell you what's wrong with you. We don't give you a label. We don't call you a victim. You know, there's a whole different way of treating people. And I think it's extraordinary. All right, guys, you, you heard it here. I'm Forbes Riley. I'm, I'm an advocate for health, wealth, and happiness. And today, I'll tell you what, we, we touched on one of the most important things. You got to stay alive to stay happy. That's important. Mm -hmm. And make sure that you know that there's a place to call for help anytime that you need it. Don't do this alone, don't struggle. Life is a decision. I would choose to be happy. I would choose to move forward because the opposite, don't, don't just don't do it. Take my word for it. Yeah. On that note, I'll see you guys again next time.